Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Jeff Mosher is co-host of the Inside the Birds podcast, which you can find on any podcasting platform or on their YouTube channel. Just search Inside the Birds. It's brought to you by Bet365. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. Eagles and Washington Commanders this Sunday right here at 1 o'clock. A football game at 1 o'clock, Jeff Mosher. How about it? They do that still? I, I'm shocked. Not much. <laughs> not much with this team. Uh, you know, they have three 1 o'clock games, and two of them are against Washington. Uh, what does that say about Washington? Right, exactly. <laughs> it was like, uh, boy, poor Washington was like, hey, uh, we like Philadelphia a lot, but you're so crappy, we don't want you on our primetime schedule. Um, let's dive into hey, some – yeah. I, I, I have to add to that. I have to add to this because I, I don't. I, don't I, I said this on the podcast. This is a really incredible stat. Or I don't know if it's a stat or a historical milestone that we have to mention about Washington – when we did our Inside the Birds NFC East preview going into the year in August, Adam and I, and I think Greg Cosell was with us, when we talked about Washington, one of the points that I mentioned was with Sam Howell, who's a lot more mobile now than Carson at Wentz was last year, right, moves around the pocket well. With Sam Howell, I said, I don't think you're going to see the Eagles sack the Washington quarterback nine times like they did last year against Carson Wentz in that first game. And wouldn't you know it? <laughs> Just a couple of days ago, Sam Howell gets sacked <laughs> nine times, not by the Eagles, but still in week three. So Washington, for two straight years, in week three, has seen its quarterback That's crazy. sacked nine times in a game. That is mind-blowing to me. That is unbelievable. <laughs> um, let's talk about the, the defensive side of the ball. They played outstanding, but they're not getting the sacks. But... Would you say I, we were talking about this with the Phillies? Who's the MVP of the Phillies? I don't know that there's a definitive answer. I think I could ask ten people, get ten different answers. Uh, so far through three games, who would be the standout player on the Eagles' defense? Oh man, uh, you're right. It's hard to to just name one guy. I think Jalen Carter probably would be the guy, though amazingly as a rookie if you had to pick one but i tell you jordan davis is right there in fact it's funny i just put out on um twitter i did a little uh, all 22 review of this last game against tampa bay specifically on run defense i focused on why the eagles have been just so dominant against the run and you know th- there's jalen carter who's just he's he, he moved for a guy who's six six three thirty five. he moves like a Corvette. I mean, and he's got violent hands and he gets in between double teams so fast. You've seen him put swim moves on where the, the, the offensive, the guards just turning around looking like he, he's behind me. How'd that happen? Right. And then Jordan Davis, Mike, for a guy who's 345 to 350 pounds and the development he's made, he has made not only some great pass rushers, but also against the run. He's not just bullying guys. He's outfoxing them with quickness and leverage and get, and both of these guys are just immovable. And as, as I watched and saw in the film, like the Bucks tried everything, two tight ends, three tight ends, pulling guards, under center, downhill. <laughs> and every time they could not generate any surge up front. I love it. Um, I think Carter's gotten a lot of conversation. How and where has Davis changed and improved? So first of all, it starts with his ability. Remember we, we talked about things can't work for the Eagles in run defense, especially with N'Kobe Dean being light and Nick Morrow being light. You know, if Jordan Davis isn't on the field, right? Last year, he was just not on the field. And when he was on the field, he couldn't play enough snaps to really be impactful. Well, he is on the field now more. He's playing the traditional nose tackle. He's also playing some three technique when they're in a 4-3 look which is just outside the guard shoulder and not over the the center. And he's staying on the field. His conditioning is so much better. He made a play. I I pinpointed it on the the All-22 review that I just put out, Mike, where he cuts across two gaps. Like, you know, again, you're trying to avoid getting blocked, right, in any way possible. And you're also trying to redirect the ball carrier. He cuts across two gaps and then bends 
around the center to just drop Rashad White in the backfield. And again, 350 pounds. How do you move laterally like that? So it, it really, the development st- with him just starts with being conditioned to be on the field for multiple plays at a time. And then the secondary part is when he is on the field, he looks like that player that the Eagles were hoping to get two years ago and they drafted him in the first round. He looks like a guy who's 350 pounds but moves like he's 200 and 50 pounds. Uh, and how is that, you know, in your mind, you watch the film, how is it uh, helping a guy like Fletcher Cox, who apparently, you know, <laughs> you know, people were done with Fletcher. Ah, you know, it's always the old guy. Ah, I'm ready to move on. He's past his prime. But it seems that he's got more gas left in the tank. Is it because he's just had an amazing offseason, or are these two guys helping him? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I think they're helping. I don't know if they're helping schematically. I mean, does he get – Fewer double teams. Well, it depends. I mean, sometimes you're running inside zone and both defensive tackles are getting double team, right? So, and then you leave the tight end maybe or a tackle to, to, to get an edge rusher. So it's not that as much as, you know, last year, I think having such a great pass rush helped Brandon Graham have his best year because he's part of a rotation, a pocket's getting pinched, and you saw the rejuvenation. He had to play a decent amount of snaps because their part that got hurt, and he was coming off an Achilles tear. And I just think the same thing with Fletcher Cox. He's part of such a great defensive rotation, defensive line rotation, and he's playing more snaps. I think maybe he's just found the fountain of youth because he's kind of inspired by what he's got there around him. And he's, I, I, I see on tape, Mike, a guy who against the run is giving all of his effort. And I do remember last year with him playing next to Javon Hargrave, I remember some of those games like Detroit in week one and Washington week eight where those guys were getting swallowed up by double teams and they didn't seem too upset about it. Um, Fletcher, I think, rebounded a little bit better as the year went on. I think Javon Hargrave was always a guy who was, you know, going to be looking for sacks. But this defensive line right now, it, they're not looking for sacks. They're not looking for stop. They're just looking to beat the guy in front of them badly, and they're doing it. Jeff Mosher, Football at Four uh, from the Inside the Birds podcast. Um Okay, I want to get your thoughts on, and we'll get back to some defensive stuff, but I want to switch back to the off or over to the offense here. Um, Nick Sirianni today was asked about DeAndre Swift. He had the hot hand. They went away from him to Gainwell in the fourth. So what is the message there? Is Gainwell their LeGarrette Blunt? They had 16 carries, 14 carries. Gainwell essentially had eight carries, though, in that last drive. So have you, in your mind, figured out the running back roles and rotation here? When you have a guy, by the way, when you have a guy, by the way, who clearly looks to have more explosion. Yes. Clearly, DeAndre Swift has more explosion. That There's no, no doubt about that. If you looked at the halftime stats, they both had five carries. On their five carries, you saw that DeAndre Swift averaged 7.1 yards per carry. And yeah, uh, and Kenny Game average, I think, 3.4 yards per carry. So you saw in the third quarter, DeAndre Swift was getting the ball mostly when they wanted to run and even when they were throwing a little bit. In the fourth quarter, when they had that lead, it went to Gainwell because they don't want to run DeAndre Swift into the ground. They know that he has struggled with, to stay healthy in the past, right? So when you're up by that, it makes sense to go to your grinder. Now, six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, when tra- train camp opened, I would have thought that grinder roll might be Rashad Penny. Yeah. Right now, he's just sitting on the the sideline. He might as well be eating a grinder, as some people in the Northeast like to call a hoagie, a grinder, <laughs> a subway, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But yeah. So so Kenneth Gainwell is maybe the oddest looking sort of closer back, like with Garrett Blunt, because he's not the biggest guy in the world, but he does a good job of converting in short yardage and grinding, and he's keeping the mileage off of DeAndre Swift. Right. So this is. Uh, their way of keeping Swift uh, fresh. Yeah, and I do think that it was even at halftime because the snaps were even because this is a team, Tampa Bay, that that blitzes a lot and sends a lot of pressure front. And so you can – it is true that Kenneth Gainwell is better in blitz pickup and pass protection than DeAndre Swift. I don't know if it's like far and away better, but better enough so that there were certain – Times I'm sure they wanted the protection out of there more so than the explosive runner. 
All right, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so, you know, Swift and Gainwell, those two guys there. Um, we'll see how those roles continue because obviously we're only three weeks in here. Um, but what about the red zone? All right, what are we seeing in the red zone? And maybe who or what needs to change or step up in that spot? Are you concerned about the red zone offense or is there more to the story? You know, that's a good question. I haven't really done a deep dive into it. You know, I was just watching the Tampa Bay tape. I, I, I thought some of the, I thought they got a little cute early in the first, you know, or trying to um, work the ball to the Dallas got it on the side or trying to work a screen uh, instead of just kind of blowing them off the ball with the running game, like they've been able to do, or even using a little bit of a zone read. If you want to run uh, Jalen hurts off tackle, it seemed like they were trying to throw the ball when they got into the red zone, which is, Hey man, last year they threw the ball really well in the red zone. I don't, I don't blame them for it, but it does seem like the bread and butter for them this so far has been to run the ball. And maybe you might want to try doing that a little bit more in the red zone. Yeah. I know uh, what they had a drop. AJ Brown had a drop in the, in the red zone there. I mean, that was a, yeah, pass that he, normally... yeah he did have a drop. You know, Dallas Goddard had, I don't know if you don't want to call it a drop. I mean, it's kind of a high throw, but one he could have handled that would have brought them to like the four, they were at the 14 at the time. And then I will say, I think if you remember the rollout play action where Hertz missed Zacchaeus in the back right of the end zone, I think that was their second or third offensive possession. I thought if he had thrown that ball a little earlier, he would have gotten Zacchaeus for a touchdown, um, but he didn't. So, and we, we clearly see Hertz is, is not seeing things exactly the way he saw it last year. Uh, I don't think it's as bad as some people have suggested, but there were some times where he did leave the pocket a little early when I didn't see the pressure there on the tape. So um, I'm sure he's looking at that and working on it. So it's it's not just one thing. Um, you said you've watched the defense uh, and, and did kind of an all-22 over at InsideTheBirds.com. I want to ask about on the defensive side of the ball, if you see that Bradbury should remain in that spot, did Job do enough to make them say we can keep Bradbury in that spot? Because I guess if Bradbury moves out of that spot, what do they do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's a little too early to tell. I'm not sure if everything that they did on Monday night was just matchup specific and they're going to do the exact same thing going forward. You know, I thought Bradbury acquitted himself fairly well. In the slot, um, you do have to worry about run fits as a slot defender, although with the way Eagles have been defending it up front, it wasn't so much of an issue. He did allow, uh, a, a, I think on third and three, he gave up like a 15-yarder to Godwin. You're gonna, he, Godwin's a good receiver. It's going to happen. Um, Joe played more off coverage than I thought he would play for a guy who likes to get physical, and that caught him at times. And, and if Mike Evans doesn't drop a few, might have might have looked worse. But he's a young player. He's just getting his a feel for the game. Um, it's not an ideal spot. Justin Evans left with a stinger, right? He's another guy who can play the slot. But he, I, I don't, I shouldn't say stinger. They said neck injury. I don't, I, you know, sometimes that's a stinger. I have no idea what the injury is. But we'll see if he's going to be out a little bit. I mean, that can kind of force their hand. Um, we'll see if the Eagles in the next 24 hours make a signing. Uh, you know, Jason Avant and Quinn Michael on the Q&A pod thought that it might benefit them to pick up a veteran slot guy so that James Bradbury doesn't have to play there full time. It's tough to pay a guy 12 plus million dollars <throat> to be your full time slot corner. So I think that there's some options out there and there's some decisions the Eagles have to make. But based on one game, I think you would see some positives and, and negatives. Uh, any possibility? I know Sidney Brown got hurt. But is he a guy that they think can play in the slot long, you know, at some point long term? Or do they like him more at that safety spot? We saw him make a play at safety. I mean, closed the gap, made that break up on Mike Evans in the end zone there. Yeah, so the Eagles did play some variations of big nickel, which is three safeties, right? Where they had Reed Blankenship, Terrell Edmonds as your, your deep safeties, and they would play Sidney Brown up in the box or in the slot against tight ends, it looked like, and again, like we need a bigger sample size. I can't take five or six different things and, and say that that's definitive. But um, so it did look like they were comfortable with him defending on tight ends in those big nickel situations. Are they comfortable with him defending slot receivers the way James Bradbury had to do Godwin and the way, you know, Avante Maddox will match up against every slot receiver in the league. I don't know. I'm not ready to answer that yet. My sense would be no, 
that it would just be sort of package specific and maybe when tight ends are flexed out that they would want him in there. All right. Uh, that's an interesting one because uh, that'll be interesting to see his kind of role evolve this season, I think. You know, keep kind of watching where he – because it, he brings some speed and definitely, uh, man, he is an explosive hitter too. I mean, he, he brings the speed. He brings the whack. I mean, and having him next to um, Reed Blankenship, they could be a nice pairing. Yeah, uh, judging by the people in my at mentions and my emails and things, I think people really want to see Sidney Brown and Nolan Smith play 100% of the snaps every game. (laughs) Nolan Smith (laughs) did get a whack out there, man. He popped uh, Mayfield on that one play. I mean, he absolutely teed off on him. Yeah, and even in the story I did on All-22, he he was actually an edge defender in a four-man front, so three down linemen and his standing up over left tackle. And he did, again, smarts. This is part of why the Eagles are doing so well. He did a really good job of avoiding a double team by just kind of crashing in between the guard and tackle before the tackle and tight end could reach on him. So in doing that, he kind of helped collapse the pocket on the left side there. And Rashad White had to stay in the middle where literally nobody's getting pushed against against Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter and the others. So it, it was a nice, smart, instinctive play in run defense by Nolan Smith that yet again helped the Eagles put the Bucks in a, in a long and unmanageable down and distance scenario. I like um, I like the way that um, this defense, uh, you know, they're not getting the sacks, they're not getting all the crazy stats, but, man, I like the way this defense is playing early, and I got to imagine as they get more comfortable with Sean Desai's play calling and his style, they'll get better and better. And, man, they're only giving up less than 50 yards a game on the ground. Now they've been leading, so teams aren't running on them. Uh, but, man, uh, defense looks pretty good so far. Jeff, uh, so like, speaking of defense, give us a quick thought on the Washington defense. You know, without having watched the tape, all I can say is that, like, every year, I think this will be the year that the four first round picks up front, and they got a first round pick in the linebacker right uh, spot, and then they got a couple of high picks on the secondary. I keep thinking, this is going to be the year where that Washington defense, like it was three or four years ago, carries that team. And then I go watch, and they gave up, what, 30 points? To the, I know they won the game against the Broncos, but wasn't it like 31-30 or something like that? And then they got their, they got pantsed by the Bills, who I think scored a bunch of points on, on defense and special teams. But nonetheless, they do not look like a shutdown defense that I keep expecting them to have when you got guys like Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen and Montez Sweat and Chase Young healthy. Like, I keep waiting for this defense to wreak havoc, and hasn't happened yet Yeah, for a couple of years now. I I was just going to say that. I've been waiting for a couple of years. We thought their defense would be the strong suit since they won that division a couple of years ago, and they really just haven't here. So, um, you know, the Bills, who don't run the ball all that much, they're not a great run team. They ran the ball a lot last week because Allen didn't have a big game for them. They did a lot on the ground. And then offensively, mm-hmm. you mentioned the sacks they gave up last week. McLaurin has hurt the Eagles in the past. They've had guys like Robinson and Gibson and guys kind of catch the ball out of the backfield against them. But, man, I, I feel like um, this this Washington offense is uh, limited. Uh, I feel like you're making a very valid point and fair <laughs> point. I mean, they've got playmakers, though. You, to your point, you're right. They've got Terry McLaurin. They have Jahan Dotson. You know, the tight end's pretty decent. When he's healthy, he's a decent player. The the common denominator is <laughs> there's just like one of the many teams that never learns their lesson, right? Like, no matter, I, I guess like just like Wash, just like the Vikings, right? The Vikings have failed to protect Kirk Cousins year after year after year. But shiny toy Jordan Addison is there. Let's go get Jordan Addison, right? Same thing with Washington. Shiny toy Jahan Dotson's here. Let's ignore our offensive line that gives up 500 sacks a year, and we'll go with the shiny toy wide receiver. Oh, but then we'll learn that we can't actually throw it to him because our quarterback is looking out of his ear hole (laughs) nine times in a game. Why they don't learn their lesson, why the Vikings and other teams don't do I, I I can't explain it. Uh, Jeff Bosher and the Inside the Birds crew. Jeff, what do you guys got uh, lined up for the rest of the week here for our uh, for the people? What uh, what what kind of uh, uh, content are you pumping out? Uh, really good stuff, Mike. You know, we had Q and A drop today, and uh, with Quentin, Michael, and Jason Avon, and uh, it was hysterical, very insightful, but also hysterical. Those guys, I think, I had me on the floor rolling around laughing with their comments, and especially Q making fun of Cowboys fans. And then Thursday. 
We've got like a double dip here. It's going to be great. We've had our Inside the Tape breakdown show with Clay Harbor and Greg Cosell, who are doing a fantastic job breaking down the tape from what they saw and then sort of previewing that on what's going to happen this coming weekend. And then also Gun on One with Derek Gunn. He's been on our platform this year. Had a sit-down uh, interview with Lane Johnson, and they really got into – Lane and his, uh, you know, awareness that he's bringing to the public on mental health, what he's gone through over the last three years. Remember how we left the team a couple of years ago in uh, one of his darker moments. So Lane goes, gets very detailed into what was, you know, on his mind, what was bothering him inside at the time, how he's gotten treatment, recovery, and why he's, it's important for him to talk about it and educate uh, people on mental health. It was a fantastic interview by Derek Gunn. Uh, and big, big shout out to Lane Johnson for agreeing to do it. So that'll be out Thursday as well. All right. Uh, check that out inside the birds.com and all their platforms in uh, YouTube. And of course, wherever you get your podcast, he's Jeff Mosher. He'll be back on a Mosher Monday to recap the Eagles and commanders right here on football at four on the sports bash. Thank you, Mosh. Got it, Mike. Take care. Uh, Jeff Mosher in the house, everybody. Make sure you check out the guys over at insidethebirds.com and the podcast.